This video is sponsored by Masterworks. Why do the Russians have so many cruise missiles of so many different models? It doesn't seem normal, doesn't it? After all, the United States has no more than a handful. The Russian, though, have an entire zoo. While some time ago I was reading the news about the Russian reaction to the attack to the Crimean bridge, a question sprang up in my mind and I actually realized that I didn't know the answer. Why do the Russians have so many cruise missiles of so many different models? It doesn't seem normal, doesn't it? After all, the United States has no more than a handful, the AGM-86, the BGM-109, the JASM and the RASM, that may be considered maybe two different versions of the same weapon, the oldish Slamyar, and the venerable Harpoon. Then, of course, there are plenty of air-to-ground or anti-ship missiles in service, but they either are not real cruise weapons or their range is so short that, yeah, they're basically tactical weapons. I'm not considering them in this video. So, for example, a tow missile is technically a cruise weapon, but its use is eminently tactical. The Russian, though, have an entire zoo. The KH-101 and 102. The 3M54 Calibre in all its variants. The KH-55 and the KH-555. The KH-59 the couple 9M728 and 729, launched from the Skander K, P600, P700, P800, the old but still in service KH22, the anti-radiation KH31, and the brand new hypersonic Zircon. Each of these has at least a couple of variants, and there are more in development, and I'm surely forgetting so many, but yeah, you get the point. Technically, the Iranian loitering munitions Shahid 136 are cruise missiles, sir. I appreciate that you didn't call them suicide drones. While US weapons are all subsonic, the Russians have subsonic, supersonic and more recently hypersonic cruise missiles. While US weapons are actually specialized weapons, many of the Russian anti-ship and anti-radiation missiles have a secondary capability to attack ground targets. So there is a big difference between the American approach, the European approach, which is sort of similar to the American, and the Russian approach. And the question is, why is it? And this is not an irrelevant question, because it may be an important point to understand what the Russians are doing now, and in this in particular relation with their air force. So tormented by this interrogative, the first thing that I did was to turn to the fountain of all knowledge, Wikipedia. Yes, I know, I know, Wikipedia is definitely not authoritative, but to do a research is definitely a good place to start, and particularly when they present all those long lists of weapons that often have uh, some references, some footnotes that point you to other interesting source material. However, the first thing I looked for was the actual definition of cruise missile. And Wikipedia says a cruise missile is a guided missile used against terrestrial or naval targets that remain in the atmospheres and fly the major portion of its flight path at approximately constant speed. Which is surprisingly correct. The rationale for cruise missiles is penetration into air defenses, usually at low altitude and at relatively long range. Actually, someone could argue that the Meteor or the Amram-D are some form of air-to-air -air cruise missiles, but let's not go into that rabbit hole, okay? <coughs> However, the long Wikipedia lists came handy. The American list of cruise missiles is interesting, but the Soviet and the Russian list 
Well, it is very, very long. There was a moment in the 50s and 60s when more than 10 different types were in service or being developed. And this is odd because it seems that you are actually dispersing your resources. So, why the Soviets did that? I went to bed mal in this question, but when I woke up, an idea had appeared in my mind. I went back to consult old scripts of old videos about the Soviet naval aviation. There, I found that in the 50s, when Stalin was still alive, the Soviet Union made the strategic choice of not confronting the United States at sea. The Soviet Navy was supposed to deny the United States the control of those waters that could influence a land campaign, but they were not going to challenge the overall control of the sea lanes. And to do so, the first asymmetric Soviet choice was made to rely on big and fast anti-ship missiles rather than on carriers and their aircraft. And since those missiles had to evade the air defenses, they either had to fly low or fly fast, or possibly both. And obviously, they were all, in a form or another, cruise missiles. This choice, though, was not exclusive of maritime operations. During the entire Cold War, the Soviet doctrine was to use long-range weapons to attack targets at any depth behind the front line or at sea, rather than executing deep piloted strikes in enemy territory. Air penetration might still have been necessary, but the air-launched weapons range was expected to be used to the maximum extent possible. However, this was not a direct answer to the original question why there were so many variants. Actually, in this light, having so many variants is no longer that surprising. If the Soviets placed such a heavy reliance on these long-range weapons, it is sort of natural that a lot of resources were dedicated to their development. From this point of view, it's not that surprising. Look at the American production of tactical aircraft in those years. It is also interesting to notice that some of the anti-ship weapons being produced in those years were given a secondary land attack capability. The reason why this is probably a spin-off of the desired capability of attacking ships in port. After the fall of Soviet Union, all these big weapons have been inherited by Russia, but since then there are other forces at work to shape the landscape. In fact, the first point to address was the qualitative gap that grew in the 80s and early 90s at an alarming pace. The second point was that the numerical superiority was simply gone. The third was that the place in the world of Russia was different than the place of the Soviet Union, so the mission of the armed forces of the Russian Federation was different than the mission of the forces of the Soviet Union, and with different missions may come different weapons. But, if this was the case, what we might have expected was a form of rationalization. We might have expected that Russia would have decommissioned these old weapons and replaced them with new models, more modern, effective and efficient. We now know that this didn't really happen, but why? I have some friends who are professionals and they are experts on this subject and after some furious WhatsApp exchanges in Italian, a picture started to emerge. When Russia had to redefine its doctrine, uh, particularly in relation to the Air Force, their doctrine became eminently defensive. <laughs> yeah, I know that it sounds odd in the light of what is happening now, but please bear with me. Russia knows very well that a lot of Western doctrine is based on air power. In the context of the NATO alliance, actually nothing serious happens if there is no air superiority. At the time, they also knew that they were catching up 
technologically with the West and uh, they couldn't achieve the numeric parity anymore. So they based their idea to neutralize the Western air power on two elements where they already knew that they had, if not a technological advantage, at least a good position. Integrated air defenses and long-range weapons. No peer-to-peer -peer fight for air superiority unless strictly necessary. No time on target deep strikes and closer support better left to helicopters. Rather keep the fighters safe behind the ground-based air defenses, use the air-to-ground capabilities not far from the front line or exclusively where there is no opposition, and most critically leave deep strike and suppression of air defenses to long-range weapons. So the Americans developed stealth to penetrate the air defenses, destroy them and acquire air superiority. The Russians plans to neutralize the opponent's offensive capabilities in depth by using long-range weapons. And this actually expanded beyond the Air Force because it prompted the development of cruise missiles based on land or shipborne. So it was clear that they had to step up a bit with these long-range weapons. And while these new weapons were being designed, uh, tested, uh, built, acquired and put in service, there were still a lot of legacy weapons. Well, the Russians conceptually hardly throw anything away, but in this case they had something to fill in for the new generation of weapons. And since the replacement has not been completed before February 2022, this is the reason why we are seeing this zoo of different old and legacy weapons in Ukraine. So there you have it. This large variety is the result of these two different eras of development of different types of cruise missiles. When it was clear that the conflict was not going to end soon, the Russians started using the old weapons to save the newer ones for high pain targets. It is really difficult to have reliable estimates, but it seems that the Russians have sort of 50% of their stock of modern weapons still available. The fact that they are using old weapons, almost obsolete or even imported very simple weapons uh, speaks volumes about the fact that they are going to preserve their best weapons for, well, the future or for a possible escalation of the war. And we must also remember that most of the Russian missiles are also capable of carrying nuclear warheads. So some of them need to be saved in case, God forbid, of a nuclear escalation. However, from the Russian side, there is no sparing of resources at all. As I said, it is extremely difficult to calculate weapon by weapon what was the expenditure in Ukraine. However, the Italian analyst Andrea Gaspardo actually calculated that adding all the long-range weapon, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, anti-radiation missiles, repurposed surface-to-air missiles, loitering munitions, everything, the Russians used an average of 100 to 120 long-range weapons every day. And uh, this is it. You are forgetting an important element, sir. The one you always talk about. Ah, you, you mean that thing? Yes, sir. That thing as you are bizarrely expressing this articulate concept. Well, I hate saying this, but Otis is right. There is another important point. Variety means resilience. What can be used successfully against one weapon may not be as successful against another. The family of ship launch caliber cruise missiles are probably the most effective and most modern weapons available to Russia in this category, has been designed and built by Novator. It entered service in 1995, but the large scale deployment was in the mid 2000s. So they are definitely not old and the newest versions are considered very capable. 
The KH-101, a semi-stealth long-range air launch cruise missile that entered in service in the mid 2000s as well, is designed and built by Raduga OKB. It is considered the best long-range weapon available to the Russian bomber fleet, even though some NATO reports show that it may have some accuracy issues. But Raduga also builds the light KH-59, which has been used in Ukraine by tactical aircraft. A new version of the same missile has been developed to be stealth and fit inside the base of the Suhoi 57, and there are unconfirmed news of its successful use in Ukraine. The cruise missiles 9M728 and 9M729 are both launched by the Iskander K launcher. They are ground based and they have a very long range. They too are quite modern, and despite the fact that the entire system in this case is, is built by Novator. It seems that one model is a Calibre derivation and the other is a KH-101 derivation. And I could go on for hours describing other manufacturers and other weapons, and maybe one day I will do it. We could talk about MPO, KRTV, all the missiles of the supersonic families, the new hypersonic uh, Zircon, and so on. Now, these weapons are all different. They all have different ancestries. They are designed and built by different people. They have different performances, different components, different guidance, different algorithms. Each one of them might require some very specific countermeasures to counter it. What may work against one may not work against the other. Terminal guidance, the terminal maneuvers, the penetration aids are all different and they may require different approaches to defend against. Just the existence of such a variety is a definite headache for whoever is at the receiving end. I certainly would not like to be at the receiving end. But I would be more than willing to be at the receiving end of this video's sponsor, Masterworks. If there's a lesson we could take from today's video, well, it's that putting together a worthy collection means covering all bases. Whether you're building a literal arsenal of weapons or an investing portfolio, you have to be prepared for each and every possibility. And if you've paid any attention to the news this year, you can see protecting your savings has never been more important. Uh, the stock market, the real estate, cryptocurrency, all on the fire for reasons mostly outside of our control. So what can the average investor do when saving money isn't enough anymore? Well, Investing 101 tells you to diversify and again, cover all bases. That's why, as everyday investors are panicking to save the stocks, the professionals, well, they are collecting new assets altogether, like fine art. Now, I'll admit, I couldn't tell you a thing about art, but it's easy to understand the logic. It's a tangible asset with limited supply and growing demand. Demand has gotten so high that even amidst the economic freefall, the average painting is selling for 26% more at auction than this time last year. But this isn't just a flash in the pan. Contemporary art has outpaced the Standard & Poor's 500 over the last 26 years by 131%. But if you are like me, you can't just blow 10 million on a painting? Well, and uh, now you don't need to, with our latest sponsor, Masterworks. With our latest sponsor, Masterworks, you too can invest in fine art. I'm talking about household names, lies, Picasso, my favorite Pasquia, and Banksy. All of this at a fraction of the cost. In six of their last exits, Masterworks returned over 20% net returns to their investors, including one just a few weeks ago for 21.5% net return. Over half a million people have joined the platform so far, and the waitlist is growing. But Millennium 7 subscribers can skip the waitlist at the link in the description. So if you are still here at this point of the video, thank you very much for your attention and your time. And thank you very much from the deep of my heart to all those who are supporting the channel by being members on Patreon or by one-off donations. 
Thank you very much to Masterworks for making this video possible. In the meanwhile, thank you very much for watching. Click on the videos that are going to appear beside me and see you next time.